Welcome to the Ides of Macro, where we discuss investing and trading through the lens of global macroeconomics. Before we kick off, this is the part where I remind everybody that this is not investment advice in any way, shape or form. In fact, this podcast is purely for entertainment and educational purposes only. Uh, but also don't forget to subscribe, press that button below to make sure that you get all the latest information and content as soon as it becomes available. And with that, we're going to go into the interview. And today I'm interviewing my partner in crime at the Lycan, Jacob Shapiro, who is the geopolitics master brain uh, of the operation Jacob, how are you? Good, Roger. I feel like usually we, we appear on interviews together or Tim and Diego are, are sort of reining us in. I, f I have the feeling that, you know, the, the parents are not home. We can do or say whatever we want. It's exciting. Well, that's right. And what I wanted to kind of really get into here is, is I mean, it's the geopolitical angle. But I'm actually going to ask my own questions, because although we're doing this partnership, I've always got quite a lot of questions. And really, it's, it's, I'm just going to kind of start very basically here, because obviously, your know, geopolitics is one of those sort of topics which everybody feels they're an expert at and it has the most kind of violent discussion when you see it on social media but in terms of you know when we're talking about investing when we're talking about the space that we're in what what are we really talking about when you think about geopolitics and the investment world yeah i mean everybody has their uncle walter or is their uncle walter sitting on the on the you know the sofa watching the news and saying oh, i have opinions about these things and you can't help but not have opinions about politics politics literally governs all of our lives but the boring answer to your question is that geopolitics is a methodology for trying to understand how different political communities primarily nation states but it doesn't just have to be nation states we can have a very nerdy argument about whether this applies to other nation states but trying to use a methodology to understand how states are going to interact with each other so in the same ways in the same way that say economics is really just the abstraction of lots of different individual people's decisions and you come up with all these equations and theories and how is the economy going to work based on how these individual people are going to consume or hire or work have babies, demographics, all those other sorts of things. Geopolitics is trying to do the same thing. It's just trying to do it on the level of, well, how do states interact with each other? And you have to go all the way from the top to the bottom and in between. And that's the boring answer to your question. I think a lot of people think of geopolitics as this kind of amorphous thing that they can touch. And it's really not. It's a method. It's a way for understanding the world. It's also an imperfect way for understanding the world. If you only, if geopolitics is the only tool in your toolbox, it'd be like building a house and all you have is a hammer. You might like, put some kind of structure up, but it probably won't look like a house. So I always try to surround myself with other tools so that I'm not the only one out there just banging away at my hammer all the time. Because, you know, if, if every problem is a nail, like you're, you're going to get some things pretty wrong. And when we always talk about geopolitics, you know, we've always sort of it's always hummed along in the background. It's always been there. But for probably most of the last 20 years, I would say it was. It was one of those things that popped up its head most frequently when nothing else was going on. You know, I remember 2000, I think it was 17, when there was nothing going on and suddenly everyone got excited about Korea. But at this moment in time, right here, right now, it is relevant. It is becoming much more entrenched. Why is that? What is it about geopolitics today that means actually for investors, you can't avoid it? You have to look at it. Well, that question is actually a great way of showing sort of the difference between me and other geopolitical thinkers, because geopolitics hasn't always been around. Now, there have been nation states and city states and political communities, and we can go back and to Thucydides and Athens versus Sparta, and a lot of geopolitical essentialists will do that. But geopolitics, as the methodology that I'm describing to you, has been around since the 19th century wasn't there before that. It was developed in the context of 19th century Europe with the decline of multi-ethnic empires and monarchies and the rise of nation states and everything that came along with nationalism and democracy and how these different states were going to interact with each other. And so I would say, you know, it, uh, geopolitics went out of style for a while because some very unsavory characters used it to develop some of their policies and their decisions. Uh, Nazi Germany, loved geopolitics. They loved defining um, their geopolitical imperatives by, oh, we must have more living space for the German people. We must take over the areas around us because these areas are lesser than us. And it's just sort of the natural course of international affairs that we would do these things. And geopolitics really goes out of style for a while because of that ideological connotation. It also goes out of style for a while because we weren't living in that world with all of these different powers and all of these different communities interacting with each other. So from the end of World War II, 
until, you know, we can debate whether it's 08 or 16 or 20, but you've got the Cold War going, uh, I'm sorry, from the end of World War II until 1990, you've got the Cold War on. So you've got, you know, two powers, United States versus Soviet Union. Geopolitics is still there to understand that, but it's relatively simple. Once the Soviet Union collapses, then you've got this unipolar period. And again, we can go to 08 or 16 or 20, how long the American period of dominance lasts. But then geopolitics is even simpler because the boring answer, you know, if I, and I was for a period like doing interviews and things like that, the boring answer to every question was, yep, United States is the most powerful country in the world. Go long the United States, go long the countries that are sort of tied to the United States. That's the answer. That's the geopolitical answer. And it didn't change for 30 years. So the reason things are becoming so relevant right now from a geopolitical perspective, because the world that we see, one where you have rising and falling great powers, where there isn't just going to be one power that dominates or even two powers that dominates. This is literally the type of international environment that geopolitics was developed to understand. And that is, I think, why people are taking that tool out of the toolbox. It's also become more interesting from an entertainment perspective because the answers are changing all the time. It's not just United States is powerful or it's the Cold War. Things are changing on a daily basis depending on what's going on with the war, what's going on with trade policy here, what's going on with demographics in Latin America. All these things are changing very fast and that's one of the reasons that suddenly people are paying attention to a methodology that usually, or at least for the last 30 years or so, has given you fairly boring answers, even if I would say those answers were actually very helpful from an investment perspective. And one thing you touched on there, you sort of said, you know, all you needed to do was be long the USA, but things are now moving quickly. For a lot of people who are um, you're listening, watching, um, investing, making money is, is the key thing. How does, because you know, one of the things that people always said is that, yes, geopolitics matters, but you can't trade geopolitics. It's not very easy because they're either very, very long time, um, time frames and scales and structures, or it happens so suddenly that you're always chasing your tail. How do you see this this geopolitical world being one, or how do you think about investing in it? Because putting the right trades onto geopolitics is actually often quite hard, or it used to always seem quite hard. Do you think that actually now trade ideas and geopolitics are much easier to match together? Well, so at the Lycaon, you know, you and I interact with each other in general, but when I'm doing my work at Cognitive Investments, we also make our money making trades and actually managing money. And I think that's one of the things that separates me from other geopolitical thinkers. But I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not a trader. They don't let me pull the, the levers on, oh, we're going to buy this or we're going to sell this. We're going to go long here, short here. They use me as a tool and I surround myself, whether it, has, whether it is at Cognitive, whether it's at Likeon with you, with people who can see the other parts of the economy and other parts of investment flows. So I think if you're only using geopolitics to make investment decisions, it's going to blow up in your face every time. And in some ways, if you are really committed to geopolitics, you're going to get things wrong. Because again, go back to what I said about the definition of geopolitics. It's about understanding relationships relations between states, which ultimately comes down to power, Understand, understanding which states have power, which don't have power, how you're going to use power against your enemies, with your allies. Markets don't care about power. Markets care about return. They care about, well, how much is it going to go up? How much is it going to go down? Understanding power is indispensable to crafting the right thesis when it comes to making a trade. And it can that can be on a long-term trade. It can also be on a very short-term trade. And we can talk about examples of both of those if you want. But the answer to your question is that I'm humble enough to know that geopolitics by itself, just like any discipline or any tool by itself, is not going to give you the whole story. Imagine if you're a stock trader and you decide, okay, like uh, I'm only going to make decisions based on EBITDA. Only that. That's going to be my only variable. And I'm every single thing. I'm, it, that's my variable. And if it's if it says yes on my chart, great. And if it's wrong or if it doesn't look good to whatever you know um, variable that I picked out, then it's no good. And kind of going from there. So I would encourage people don't think of geopolitics as sort of this one all, be all, end all, silver bullet. Think of it in terms of one of the factors you need to understand when you're making a trade, because sometimes it can identify a risk that you aren't thinking of with your trade. And sometimes you can unearth an opportunity that maybe nobody else is looking at because you're able to see through a lot of the noise and say, ah, I see something here that nobody else has seen because I look through this very particular lens. And do you have um, a kind of investment frame? Because I've heard a, a, quite a few people in geopolitics say um, things like it's often very hard to predict 
something, but once it's happened, it's often easier to then position yourself for how it might um, evolve and then, uh, and then how we come out the other side. Do you actually say, think that actually you can see things coming and therefore you can position for that? Yes, there are things that no, we can't see because they just come out of the, out of the blind side, but then we can see how they develop. Do you actually have a framework? Do you see things that can build that you can then invest in? Or is it you kind of, you know, it's, it's a slow kind of, okay, here's a big framework, I'm going to play this long game, or do you have other, other ways of playing it? I mean, what you describe, somebody who would say, yeah, of course it's hard, but if you're going to throw up your hands and say, then, I mean, that's kind of honestly a cop-out. Uh, the less diplomatic version of that would be, that's bullshit. Um, you have to make a certain number of calls. And I think most geopolitical thinkers are not used to making calls and having the market actually judge them on their decisions. So even the best trader in the world is what? Going to be right 51% of the time, 52% of the time. That's what you want to sort of aim for. And you want to be able to change your mind really quickly. And I think that's another reason that geopolitics is so difficult because it's one thing to make you know different decisions about equities or bonds that you're trading it's not personal but politics is personal as we start we talked about at the beginning everybody's their uncle walter everybody has opinions about how the world should be or what they feel about rishi sunak or why they think trump is a threat to the democracy all of that gets in the way of actually making decisions when it comes to geopolitics so i actually you know all i need to do is i need to be right 51% of the time, I need to be able to change my mind really quickly when one of my frameworks breaks apart. But in general, that's how I'm looking at things. I don't sit here and tell you, oh, I have a magic crystal ball and I can predict all things with geopolitics, but I'm in the game of investing money. So as long as I'm right more than 51% of the time, and as long as geopolitics gives me the tools to recognize both opportunity, but more importantly, when I'm wrong and when I need to get out of a trade that is not working then it's good for me and then I'm going to continue doing it. So that's how I'd answer that question. Of course it's hard, but when you actually have skin in the game, just because it's hard doesn't mean you stop. It means that you do things like have risk controls or surround yourself with people who tell you, okay, well, here's the stop. And if it goes below this, or if we see X, Y, and Z, we don't care how passionately you feel about the argument we're getting out of the trade. So those are you know, all some of the reasons why it is very hard, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. And it doesn't mean you can't use the methodology to give you good trades or get out of trades that didn't go right that you were expecting to. And, and the trades that you sort of look at, it, it always feels to me that geopolitics, you sort of, the, the first go-to tools in terms of, of investing would be things like currencies and commodities. Do you think that those are still the, the main areas, plus maybe volatility, stuff like that? Or do you find that you're investing in, in every asset class pretty much everywhere, depending on the story? It just depends on the story. And I mean, you know, I work in investment. I also advise corporations sometimes too. So when I'm advising a corporation on supply chains, that can also create its own set of variables that you have to look at. But yeah, I I will say that, you know, geopolitics is sometimes easier to express with commodities or it's easier to express uh, with currencies sometimes, but not all the time. And I think it's less about focusing on a particular asset class. And for me, it's more about, okay, do I understand the situation geopolitically? Then let me go and talk to my trading team and be like, okay, well, how do we express this thing? A great example of this, when I first started working with CI, I, I really wanted to impress them. And so they asked me what I thought about Turkey. And I thought they were asking me what I thought about Turkey because the Turkish lira was in one of its nosedives. And I thought they were going to want to go short the Turkish lira. So I built this beautiful analysis, pages long, about the history of Turkey and how it related to geopolitics and markets. And I did all this extra research. And I concluded with them, this is why you should short the lira, thinking that I was really, really smart. And they read through the report. We had a meeting about it. And they said, Jacob, this is incredible work. Uh, we think we're going to go long Turkish equities based on this report. Thanks so much. And it was one of the best performing trades we did that year. And I was sitting there thinking, well, geopolitics, I thought I was doing it for this one thing. And they saw, no, like you're actually, even though you're very pessimistic on Turkey, the reasons why you were pessimistic were interesting. And you were a little bit less pessimistic than the rest of the market. So we think there's actually an opportunity here with equities that you maybe didn't spy. So yes, like I, especially when you're going into fundamentals and supply and demand and competition over resources, I do find sometimes that I keep on going back to commodities over and over again, but it really just depends on the thesis or the story. So rather than say, I only focus on this asset class, I focus on the geopolitical story. And then we go to the research team or the trading team and say, is there a way to express it? Sometimes there isn't. You know, I would tell you right now, one of the great frontier market economies in the world is Cuba or Venezuela. 
nothing you can do with that. You can't position a client to sort of, if you're, if you're an American, you can't go buy Venezuelan stocks unless you want to risk your life and you know, get thrown in jail by the U.S. government. So, you know, it, it doesn't even always give you ways to express it. But that's where I try and spend my time on understanding the geopolitics and then working with people to understand, all right, what's the right asset class? What's the right way to express this? Is there a way to express this in a way that actually accounts for risk and everything else? And one, one of the things where we've actually sort of um, I always had disagreements, we sort of discuss about different time frames is in the commodity space. And I mean, maybe we'll touch on that. Maybe we'll look at some of the, the sort of the potential trades out there, because I think one of the things you know, we always hear at the moment is that there's a massive transitional trade, the energy transitional trade, which is going to impact commodities, metals, etc. This is going to be for decades long. Um, but then you always sort of say, yes, that's true. And yes, it might be a long term trade, but you don't need to necessarily wait for the next recession because there are political stories, because a lot of the um, major mining regions are subject to political issues. And, you know, we're talking some of the South America places. Um, When you when you're building your thesis on, for instance, commodities. So let's say let's just take a basic one. Let's say copper, you know, and Mm -hmm. I go for the next 20 years. But maybe we wait for the next recession where we'll get copper coming off. You buy into it then. Do you feel that copper is one which should be based on the more short term trade, more not trades, but more short term stories around the actual production areas themselves right here, right now, some are having problems, some aren't. What's, what's the way that you look at these sort of big mega trends, but also combine the, the geopolitical angle? Well, the mega trends, that's just a word for having a framework. So you have to have a forecast, not because you're going to be 100% right, because you have to have a sense of where you're going. So if we're in this commodity super cycle, that means you're bullish about certain commodities being used over time in terms of growth areas. And I agree, you can make a very, very strong case that there is not enough copper in the world or that there won't be enough copper in the world for the next six years to match all of these very ambitious things that we're going to do in terms of building houses to electric cars to, I mean, coppers and wind, it's in solar, all of these sort of next generation energy technologies. It's all in that plus all the stuff we already use it for plus or qualities declining in most of the existing mines in the world. So you can make that macro thesis. But most commodity traders will tell you, first of all, every single commodity is idiosyncratic idiosyncratic. And number two, very, very few people have ever made any money buying and holding commodities. You're not going to buy copper today and hold the copper for three years and sell it. Like that's just not the way things actually work. So you have to look, I think when it comes to commodities, you have to position yourself right. Because if you get there at the right time, yeah, you can 5x, 10x if you have the right timing. But if you buy and hold at the wrong time, you can be caught holding a bag, even if you were right sort of about the, the macro thesis. So Think of it this way. Like for me, copper, it checks the box on the long-term screen. Like, yes, at the macro level, there's not enough copper in the world. There's going to be more copper demand in the long run. That should be copper demand should be going up and to the right. Now we have to figure out, okay, well, what is going to cause certain spikes or what is going to cause certain declines? If we have a massive global recession, which you talk about sometimes, well, maybe it doesn't matter that in 2028, we're not going to have enough copper for the next four years. Maybe copper is going to do really, really poorly or turn around and say, well, Chile is talking about nationalizing lithium. What if they nationalize copper or Peru has these protests that might actually be um, halting the supply chain of copper from Peru from getting to markets? And that's one of the biggest uh, copper exporters in the world. Is that going to affect short term supply and drive up the price? So I think it's important to have that long term macro view. But when it comes to actually playing commodities, I think it really depends on well, what's going on in a particular uh, environment. And you really can't see th- that far into the future as well with some of these things. Um, you know, maybe they'll find a substitute for copper that we haven't heard of, uh, or even researched yet. And in two years, everybody will be talking about that rather than something else. You can see this in the way that everybody thought lithium was going to go up. And now there's too much lithium. So it's all the way down. You have to follow that seesaw back and forth. It's a commodities is really fun. And there's a lot of return to be had there. But it's not for the faint of heart, you have to be tracking things closely and willing to change over time. And there's a couple of um, commodities where you think they are not so much red herring, but you know, with the with the electric vehicles, um, you know, there's some of the some couple of bullish stories aren't there out there where you're kind of thinking, well, actually, is there really going to be enough of this stuff to really make a difference? Is it cobalt, one of them, where you're just not quite sure it's going to get the sort of it could be the opportunity to fulfill all our dreams, and therefore, actually, we may be chasing a red herring on that one. Well, this is a place where I would say you really can't um, extricate technology from geopolitics. And if geopolitics focuses on things that don't change that much over time, you know, there's a mountain here, it blocks this country from attacking this country, or this country doesn't have any of this resource, it's just not going to have that resource. So it's always going to be an importer. 
um, versus technological change. And technology can change incredibly quickly. My, the example I always use for this is the U.S. semiconductor industry. The reason that we have the semiconductor industry and smartphones and all these other things, it's not because you and I could send cat videos to each other. It's because in the 1950s, the United States government wanted to put microchips on their missiles so that they could more accurately strike targets in the Soviet Union. And that changed everything. And everything that happens afterwards with semiconductors goes back to sort of that geopolitical point. So I would say here, you really, you really have to be reading the technology or have access to people who are experts on the technology. So here today, I don't think we have any idea what the dominant technology for vehicles is going to be five, 10 years from now. Is it electric vehicles? All of which is to say, and again, this it's funny that I'm a geopolitical expert and yet I'm telling you all the deficiencies and limitations of geopolitics. You actually need to be thinking about technology on a very... Uh, on a top-down basis. So I work, for example, with a scientist who just last week sent me an article about how maybe China made some progress with a sodium ion battery. Very early stages, but if suddenly you can have a sodium ion battery rather than a lithium ion battery, literally changes everything. There's plenty of sodium. You don't have to go to three countries in South America for it. Maybe all these countries that are nationalizing lithium and everybody who thinks lithium is the next big thing, it could all be for naught because somebody in a lab figured something out. Um, so I, I think... Like, I wouldn't tell you to stay away from electric vehicles or from any of the things that come with the clean energy transition. Just accept that we're at the, you know, in addition to all the geopolitical things that we're talking about here, we're in the initial stages of a real tech revolution when it comes to energy. We haven't had a tech um, energy revolution like this since the world moved from coal to oil in the early 1900s. And it was not a foregone conclusion that oil was going to win the day. If it was, everybody would have just bought shares of Standard Oil and would have gotten super rich. But probably not a lot of people did because, again, oil prices were up and down because it was boom and bust. And that's how commodities work. Um, so th that's a long way of saying, I don't think you can say anything for sure about electric vehicles or clean energy technologies right now. You can have theses, you can have, you know, I'm very interested in nuclear, I'm very interested in matter and materials that go into nuclear or that go into electric vehicles and things like these. But if you're just sitting there and saying, no, buy SQM because lithium is going to take off and SQM has a lot of lithium in Chile, like that's... That smacks of not using geopolitics or investment principles or anything correctly. That's just, oh, Uncle Walter saw something on TV and he said it sounded good. It's actually much more complicated if you want to um, get access to the things that are going to change and also not get your face ripped off when one of your theses doesn't go right. Because when you're dealing with things like this, it absolutely will. And one of the big sort of stories going around at the moment has been on Twitter. It, I think I saw it's probably had more coverage in social media than any time in the last 10 years is this whole dollar debate again. I mean, it comes around and every now and again, and everyone says the dollar is dead. Um, we've talked about this before. We've talked about the difference between the level of the dollar, you know, where it trades versus the euro or the yen or whatever, and the importance of the dollar. But where do you stand on, on this debate? I mean, there's a lot of people who are sort of saying, we are seeing India and China and Russia and other emerging market countries wanting to trade in their local currencies. And then the next thing you know is that actually India can't and won't do anything in rubles or whatever. Where do you, where do you see, I mean, you know, the dollar's always dead and then it's not. It's been going on forever. What's the true story in your, in your world on that space? Yeah, I, I've gotten so bored of talking about the dollar. I mean, for years now, I've been saying, look, the dollar's not going anywhere. One of the first things I wrote for Likeon also years ago was about how the dollar wasn't going anywhere. And now everybody seems to have caught on because that's a really easy thing to say. Um, I think it actually, uh, you know, how the dollar is so important to the global financial system, that's one way to understand things. And I think there are opportunities around that in general. I think, and Michael Pettis is the one that really opened my eyes to this, and I'm reading his book right now, so that's one of the reasons it's top of my mind. But is it actually good for the United States that the dollar is the global reserve currency? Lots of countries like Japan and China have actually taken advantage of the dollar being the global reserve currency. And all these armchair analysts who are out there saying the dollar's not going anywhere, it will stay the reserve currency. I think they actually missed that there are actually a lot of negatives for the United States with it being the reserve currency. It takes a lot of flexibility away from the United States. I don't know that you can have Biden's industrial manufacturing policy and also have the, the dollar be the global reserve currency. Like at some point, those things are going to clash. But, and this is where geopolitics is really boring, like these shifts don't happen quickly. To get people off of their dependence on the dollar, you're going to have to have a major change in the global system because you're going to take losses if you go away from that. Inertia is very powerful. Um, the pound did not lose its status as the global reserve currency after World War I. It took World War I and World War II for the pound to lose its status as a global reserve currency. So we need that kind of shift 
in the global economy if people are just going to turn their backs on the dollar in terms of its importance for, you know, uh, financial flows and pricing commodities and all these other things. If Brazil and China want to, you know, convert their dollars into Hei or into Yuan before they ship them to each other, okay, fine. If Russia wants to isolate itself like a, you know, like a North Korea, if you want, in the middle of Siberia and not use dollars, okay, fine. Like, it's not going to change things in the global system that much. And this is the other thing I would say. If you look at where the dollars lost market share from in the last decade or so, yes, China, I think, has gone from like 2% to 4%. So now it's like relatively on par with the Canadian dollar. So unless we're worried about the Canadians taking over the world, chill out about the Chinese you want. It's not going to do anything. The, the currency that's actually made some moves is the euro. And there are parts of Western Africa where trade settlement happens now in euros more than it happens in dollars. And that's because the Europeans, they're closer to sub-Saharan Africa. They have colonial ties to sub-Saharan Africa. Their demographics suck. So they're thinking about, oh, we need labor or we need new markets to sell things to because we can't sell to China like we used to. There are some very interesting developments there. And the dollar is losing a foothold in some places based on geopolitics. But that's a very nuanced conversation. What's happening in media right now is everybody's like, oh, dollar, dollar king or dollar dead. And people are squaring off on that. And the honestly, the argument has gotten so banal that I, I almost turn it off because nobody's actually talking about what that means or how to express that in trades or what we're kind of doing going forward. I guess that's why you and me <laughs> do what we do. Right. Well, I was going to say, you know, what, what, is, what is the trade? Because, you know, the, the, the trade isn't being long or short of the dollar. That's going to be down to interest rate differentials and flows of capital in the short term. And, and you know, there are lots of good reasons to be long or short of the dollar on that basis, but not on the whole, is the dollar dead or not? So when you, talk, when you think about this, this erosion, or you think about regional rises of usage in, let's say, the euro, again, I can't really express that because if sub-Saharan Africa uses the euro, but everybody else thinks that Europe's a basket case, then Europe might, euro might still go down anyway. So do you look at, what's the sort of trade that you'd look at to express that sort of view where you're seeing European involvement in certain regions or, you know, U.S. involvement more in its own backyard or whatever. How do you play that? Because you can't really do it in a currency which is supranational. I don't think geopolitics tells you much there. Um, I can tell you over at CI, like, um, it really, as you said, it comes down to interest rate differentials. It comes down to, okay, the United States, uh, the Federal Reserve has different interests right now than the European Central Bank, has different interests than the People's Bank of China, than the Bank of Japan. And in those differentials, there are trades. Um, I'm, I'm, we are of the mind at CI that the dollar probably has room to run here, that you, know, the, you could see another leg up in dollar strength in general, because during times of um, uncertainty and volatility, usually people want the asset that you can, that is most fungible and that you can, and that's the dollar right now. But there's nothing really geopolitical in that argument. That, like you say, that's much more about interest rates and things like that. The, the geopolitical argument that I think you can sort of make from that, and that it goes into other places is, you know, stop for a moment and, and, and recognize how uh, crazy it is that the European Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, and the Federal Reserve are on completely different pages. That hasn't happened for 25 or 30 years, maybe going further back. After the 2008 financial crisis, those three economies, everybody was, all those central bankers and bureaucrats, they were talking back and forth. How do we limit contagion? How do we align our policies so that things don't get too far out of control? It's not that way anymore. The, the United States has been trying to crush inflation. Europe's trying, oh, we want to manage inflation, but we have a war on with Russia, and we've got these prices, uh, you know, price spikes in commodities, and China's coming out of an economic catastrophe. They're trying to stimulate the economy. So there is something to be said there in terms of, wow, that's what deglobalization looks like. Suddenly, the three biggest economies in the world aren't on the same page. But to your point, I wouldn't use geopolitics to make a thesis today or for the next six to 12 months about where the dollar's going. You need an economist or an expert on the Federal Reserve or somebody who you know, had brunch with the chief bureaucrat of the European Central Bank. Like That's going to be a lot more valuable to you in figuring out where the dollar goes for the next three to six months than talking to me. Fair enough. So and then let's go to the de uh, de uh, deglobalization because I think that's one of the more interesting areas you've talked about where um, when most people who talk about deglobalization, they talk about it again in this relatively negative world of, oh, you know, the world's changing, more inflation. But actually, deglobalization is going to throw up loads of opportunities because you, you, you're going to get these regional hubs. Where do you think are, are going to be the sort of the exciting places? Because in this reshaping world where we have, you know, a little bit more of a breakdown, there are going to be some really good opportunities there. And you've got a couple that you quite like, haven't you? 
I do. And I have countries that I don't quite like. And I think one of the things that geopolitics really does is there's value in picking the right countries and in picking the wrong countries, which really hasn't been true for the last 30, 35 years. When the United States was the top global power and China was in on it, China was going to be the world's factory and China had the scale that all companies wanted. And everybody was, you know, companies are still basing their projections on what they think they're going to sell to the Chinese middle class, even though the trade war has made all of that obsolete. Um, And a lot of these countries that we're going to talk about here, um, they feel like they got the raw end of the deal because they couldn't compete with China. In an era where globalization and free trade was really governing things, China outcompeted everybody because they had a billion people and they had a Chinese Communist Party that could come in and just say, here are the rules and the rules are we want foreign investment. So do what we say or you're, you know, we have a nice gulag for you somewhere in Xinjiang or elsewhere. You know, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, India, they, countries couldn't compete with that. Yes, maybe they had cheap labor, but they didn't have the, the combination of labor um, and expertise and a government that was willing to do those sorts of things sort of all together. Um, so like that's the world that we were in. And the world that we're going towards, I think there is a lot of value in picking the countries that are going to do well and pick, picking the countries that aren't. And if you look at returns you know, on a country basis um, for which countries are going to do well, even in the last couple of years, you're beginning to see that. If you pick the right countries versus the long countries, there's actually a lot of investment returns to be made there. Um, I would tell, let's, you know, some of the countries that I like the most, um, you know, let's, let's divide them into two classes. The first is countries that can be regional powers in their own right. Um, and for me, that's, it's a short list. It's, it's Brazil, it's Turkey, um, it's India, and it's maybe Indonesia. And I'm not necessarily bullish on all four of those countries, but those are the ones that on the framework, they check the boxes because they're big enough that they can have economies of scale. Um, they are either power than the, than, uh, more powerful than the countries that are around them, or in the case of like Brazil, don't really face threats around them. So they can sort of create regional economies where they are the center um, of that particular area. They have relatively sophisticated um, manufacturing bases, or if they aren't sophisticated, they have tons of people. Sort of India and Indonesia have tons of people. Turkey and Brazil, to a lesser extent, they have uh, more sophisticated manufacturing bases. You sort of put the picture together. And these are countries that check some of those boxes. Um, Sitting here today, very optimistic about Turkey and Brazil. I feel like I change my mind about India every other day. And Indonesia, I was actually a little more circumspect of, but I'm beginning to come around on it. Um, But those are examples of countries that I think will do well. The flip side of that is what are countries that won't do well? So those are countries like Russia. I thought Russia, I was sort of scared of Russia even before the Russia-Ukraine war, and they've consigned themselves to not doing particularly well going forward. Um, Nigeria is a country that I wouldn't go anywhere near. Argentina is a country that's a dumpster fire that's, that I wouldn't go anywhere near. So that's sort of the first class of countries. The second class of countries is countries that are not necessarily going to be regional powers, but maybe they benefit from being close or being allied to that regional power. So here, think of a country like Mexico. Mexico is not going to be a regional power in and of its own right, but I don't think, just because I think the world is multipolar doesn't mean I think the United States is going to collapse. And if the United States is going to be a power in and of its own right, Mexico is going to soak up all that opportunity because they are the real ace in the hole for the United States. All these companies that are leaving China and Asia in general, Mexico is going to soak up a lot of that interest. Um, Ukraine is actually a great example of this too. What if uh, I can imagine a scenario where Russia loses the war, Ukraine emerges independent and eventually gets integrated into the European Union? Suddenly, Ukraine um, and Eastern European countries that help rebuild it is going to be one of the biggest opportunities you could possibly get. Um, Another example of this type of opportunity is Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is probably most people couldn't even put Uzbekistan on a map, but it is at the center of Eurasia. Uh, It was on the Silk Road a long time ago. And if we're going to build this new Silk Road, uh, it's going to be the connective tissue that stitches together Eurasia in that particular way. So those are examples of countries that maybe they're not regional powers, but they are positioned in areas where they might be able to do well in and of their own right because they're in the right place. And when you talk about um, you know, talk about that, the bipolar world and obviously we all focus on the U.S. and China, in China, I mean, China's, again, like the dollar story, it divides opinion. Everybody either thinks it's going to collapse into debt or it's going to take over the world. And obviously the reality is probably somewhere boringly in the middle of that, doing not much different from where we are today. But where, where do you see this? Because you know, there's two things with, with China. One is you know, it's got the debt, it's therefore going to collapse. And then the second one is it's being aggressive with Taiwan. Both those to me always seem overly hyped and are unlikely to change significantly um, in, let's say, the next 12 or 24 months. But what do you see as the things for people to watch for? Because what what matters to me as an investor is, okay, if I think this is going to be relatively boring, what's the thing that I need to see that will tell me, sit up, pay attention, because it's no longer boring? 
Yeah, well, let's start with the easy one. I, I don't worry that much about Taiwan. It doesn't keep me up at night. Um, China's being aggressive with Taiwan. Okay, great. So they increased their military exercises. Reintegrating Taiwan into the People's Republic of China has been the number one foreign policy goal of China literally since 1950. <laughs> okay, like not much has actually changed. Um, do they want to reintegrate it? Yes. Will they try again one day? Probably, although I think they want to do more like what they did with Hong Kong, where they just want to make it a fait accompli. Um, but are they building ships to do so? Yes. They built their first really modern amphibious landing ship. So to to take troops from the mainland to the island. You need amphibious ships to get them there, right? They built their first new class of sophisticated ones that could do that last year, the first one. Okay, like build another hundred and I'll start paying attention. Teach your, your pilots to fly on and off those new aircraft carriers that you literally just launched. Then we're going to talk about it. So I don't mean to say that China-Taiwan is not an issue, but it's an issue that, you know, for instance, I have an almost one-year-old daughter. I worry about Taiwan from her perspective. I worry that when she's a teenager or when she's going to college, what U.S.-China relations look like and if we're dumb enough as a species to go down great power war and competition like that. But here today, don't worry about that so much with China. Debt is a much bigger deal. And debt's a much, a much bigger deal, not because the whole system's going to collapse in on itself or anything like that, but because debt is at least is one sort of indicator in the health of China as a unified country, whether it's getting stronger or whether it's getting weaker. Um, we have thousands of years of Chinese history to look at this. And in general, when China starts to come apart at the seams, you see that the central government is not able to dictate things to the various provinces or to the various regional warlords that are all around. Um, and things like, you know, protests or not paying mortgages or uh, debt, uh, really reducing the ability of Chinese households to do the things that they want to do from an, e from an economic perspective. Those are all things that start to challenge the social fabric of China. Now, I don't think you're seeing any of that. If anything, you're seeing the central government right now in China, the Chinese Communist Party, is centralizing power. She is the dictator. If you If you oppose the Chinese Communist Party, you're going to jail. You're not you know, assembling an army of peasants and challenging the government. So I think what you want to look for with China is, is the Chinese Communist Party still strong? Is it able to say, hey, we do have problems with debt. And one of the only ways we're going to be able to deal with that is we're going to have to transfer money from the wealthy coast to the impoverished interior. And we can no longer just sweep bad assets under the rug into fancy asset management companies and do some accounting voodoo. We are actually going to have to say, okay, some of these companies that have profited during the era of globalization, you have to hold the bag. Or, hey, bank that made the irresponsible loan, we told you not to do that. This is what the real, the real estate property crisis with China was really all about. The developers thought they weren't going to get their hand slapped by Xi. And she was like, actually, no, you can fail. I told you not to do that. I told you that three years ago not to do that, and you did it anyway. So those are the types of things that I watch for with China. I think overall, I'm fairly optimistic that China gets through this period and emerges more powerful and more prosperous. Um, but it's going to be a very difficult period here for at least the next three to five years and probably beyond that. That's why also Taiwan doesn't matter to me so much because I think everything that China does, it's going to be about internal issues. It's going to be about domestic politics. It's going to be about the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party in the eyes of the Chinese people. And while I just gave you sort of a more optimistic spin on it, I can very easily make the opposite argument. I just don't think we're seeing data for it yet, but that's something I'm watching for constantly. That's why the real estate crisis was so concerning, because when you look at how many Chinese people have their assets invested in real estate, state, you look at people not paying mortgages, you're like, huh, okay, something here is going on. But Chinese Communist Party intervened and seems things seem to be going back to normal on that front. So now they have to go to whatever their next crisis is. It's probably going to be local government debt, if I had to guess. Um, but if they're able to metabolize each one of these sort of challenges and keep the machine going, then, then things, uh, you know, I think they'll muddle through in the same way that, you know, Japan muddled through, maybe not, you know, uh, if you were an investor and you were holding you know, Japanese stocks from 1989, muddle through is not what you want. Maybe you want to look elsewhere for the next three to five years. But from the perspective of geopolitics, like Japan did fine, right? They muddled through. There wasn't a revolution. There wasn't a coup, anything like that. That, I think, is what China has to aspire to over the next couple of years if it's really going to take that next st uh, step in its growth. And uh, with Japan, I mean, something you talked about a couple of months ago, I think, um, with, with one of the podcasts was about how... Um, everyone expects Japan to change, but they don't. And, and sure enough, the uh, was it the first BOJ meeting with the new governor. They basically said, "Yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll carry on as we've been going before." This is the thing with with Japan is you, you know Japan. It's not going to change, is it? It's just going to keep this unusual policy mix that it's got. 
it will probably keep that unless something radically changes in the underlying sort of international fabric that allows them to walk away. They're quite stubborn, aren't they, Japan, in a good way, in terms of they, they keep doing what they keep telling us. Well, this is true of all non-Western countries. Um, you know, countries do things in their own interest and they do things for their own cultural reasons. Um, I often say it's much easier in today's world to get information about China, even though Chinese data is really bad and it's hard, like accepting all the challenges. I find it much more difficult to get clarity on what Japan is doing and thinking than what China is doing and thinking because Japan's much more of a black box. If you don't speak the language, if you don't have ties with people who are at upper echelons of corporations or the government, you can't really figure out what's going on. They keep all of that very close to the vest. In the same ways, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, when everybody was freaking out that um, Lula, the new president of Brazil, uh, was saying things that the West didn't like about Russia and Ukraine, he's not doing that because he's evil. He's doing that because Brazil imports a lot of fertilizer to keep their agricultural sector going. And who exports a lot of the fertilizer in the world? Well, it's China and Russia. So he can't afford the luxury of armchair Uncle Walter political principles. He has to make sure that the fertilizer flows keep open. And that means he's got to say something shit about you know ukraine and this that or the other thing so i think um you know and i'm happy for the media con to continue doing this because um one of the reasons i have a successful career is because the media keeps on going to these tropes whether it's the dollar or oh uh, japan must do this or lula is evil for saying this about ukraine if you actually stop and understand sort of what japan's imperatives are or what brazil's imperatives are well then you might actually learn something and then you might actually try and understand what's going to happen next um i think japan you know um it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's in that sort of Financial Times, Wall Street Journal vortex. Everybody expects it to act like the Federal Reserve. And why should it? Japanese society is very strange and very idiosyncratic. They have their own demands and their own needs. And the Bank of Japan is going to make decisions based on what Japan needs, not on what the, the Financial Times editorial staff thinks that Japan needs because their economists told them something. And so then just coming back in terms of, you know, we, we've touched on the U.S. and a bit of Latin America and obviously a bit of Asia with, with China and Japan. But um, the, the sort of basket case that always rears its ugly head every now and again um, is Europe. At the moment, Europe is relatively quiet. Um, what, what sort of, you know, we, we are always going to have some existential thoughts about Europe every time there is a semi quasi radical leader um, elected in one of the countries. It's, it's basically... The key issues for Europe, what do you see as, and when I say Europe, I really mean the Eurozone rather than greater Europe and the potential for reintegration of, of East Europe if the Ukraine war gets solved. What do you see as being the main things? I mean, is it just a case that the Euro being the basket case it is will always be a basket case every five to ten years? Yes, yeah, so this is, uh, this is an important question. Um, and sort of my long-term framework on the European Union is I'm optimistic about the future of the European Union. And I'm optimistic about the future of the European Union because I think the challenges that face the EU outweigh the domestic issues that have torn it apart for the last 15 to 20 years. So if the EU does not come together, you've got China and Turkey and Russia and the United States and all these other powers around it that just want to do their own things. So if Europe decides to keep squabbling about relatively minor issues internally related to domestic politics, um, then Europe's going to break apart. Maybe the European Union won't actually fall apart. I'm sure they'll be issuing circulars from Brussels if, you know, we have a nuclear holocaust and only the cockroaches and the bureaucrats, you know, putting out the automatic statements and Brussels are putting things out. Like, I'm not saying the EU is going to fall apart from that point of view, but you can imagine a world in which, oh, well, some European countries go with Turkey and some go with Great Britain and some go, you know, th that's sort of the future for Europe if it doesn't come together. Now, it might not come together. Um, I think this is the the real time of crisis for Europe is right now because they won't have impetus to make the changes they need to make like the Russia war and like COVID. I, I don't think you're going to get another chance or a crisis like that. And the early returns on this have not really been that promising. There was a you know, a first gasp to, okay, we're going to do joint debt issuance. Okay, that was a good sign for somebody like me who's optimistic about the European Union being a major geopolitical player. But just look at what's happened the last couple months. Back to arguing about migrants. Back to stupid issues about, oh, well, the farmers in Poland are mad about Ukrainians dumping grain. So they're going to say, they're going to raise a middle finger to Brussels and say, hey, we're just going to do whatever we want, even though the whole premise of the European Union is that you can't do whatever you want. Everybody has to do the same thing um, to pull power and sovereignty together. So I think that, uh, I think that the European Union will meld through will muddle through this and i think that they will be stronger afterwards and they're going to have to make some fundamental changes all of these sovereign proud powers from germany to poland from france to montenegro whoever whoever's around they're going to have to say okay we're ceding some of our sovereignty to this larger group so that we can be 
um, a sort of global economic player because none of Europe's powers by themselves can really do that. Maybe France, maybe Germany, if you want to be generous, but they have sort of their own problems. So um, that that's really where it is um, in terms of the European Union. And I would say my optimism in the long term, it hasn't been a good few months of the year. Uh, I'm ve- I, I didn't like this whole uh, Polish Romanian grain issue. I don't like that Poland is you know basically challenging the legitimacy of EU law and Brussels isn't slapping it across the wrist. You've got Hungary, which is challenging the European Union sort of left and right. Um, even Germany and France are squabbling about silly, stupid things. So you've actually gotten some signs this year that maybe my long term optimism um, is not warranted. But those are the types of things um, that I look at in general. And the last sort of, you know, because most people, most people are investors looking at this, um, I don't have any active positions right now with Europe. But last September, when everybody, you know, I think the, the wasn't one of the covers of The Economist was, you know, people are going to be freezing in the streets. That was a little bit too far. And I was, I was out here by myself being told I was a lo- looney tune saying, I, I don't think this natural gas, I, I don't think it's going to go that way. I actually think that when you get to European ingenuity in the face of a crisis, you're really underestimating Europe's ability to manage a crisis. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as kind of going forward. And that was a good call for me. I don't have anything that solid or certain right now with Europe for the year ahead. I'm watching. Uh, and what I'm seeing so far this year doesn't look very good. But I think the long term framework is still in place. And we'll have to see what happens. And within Europe, I mean, I've, you know, there's the one, the one country that I joked about with Julian Brigden um, on the last Ides of, uh, of Macro was um, we're amazed at, at how successful the German equity market is, given that there seems to be this potential global slowdown. We just saw some atrocious data out of Germany. Um, we seem to confirm that its, its end markets have slowed down considerably. Will, will Germany almost inevitably become... A lesser of a player. I'm not saying the least important, a, a less important player, but maybe it's dominance within Europe, or it feels like it's dominance at least as a, as a trading powerhouse, at least in the decision making. Obviously, under Merkel, do you think that, Europe, that within Europe, Germany will probably diminish slightly from here? Has it had its peak? Um, well, first of all, never underestimate Germany. Tons of people have underestimated Germany over time. I, I wouldn't be one to do that. Um, second of all, I mean, this is a, another one of those media tropes. I mean, let's go back to The Economist in the late 90s and the sick man of the euro. And Germany's not going to be able to reintegrate East Germany. And the whole thing is going to fall apart. And they're old and they're dying. And the demographics, that wasn't true. If you had ignored Germany from 2000 until now, you would have really missed out on one of the best economic growth stories in the world. Um, does Germany have problems? Absolutely. Um, do I like the position that Germany's in right now? I'm not sure. German equities you know, bottomed because of that gas crisis that we were talking about because everybody had thought apparently we were back to Weimar Germany and it was going to be a repeat of the 20s and 30s. Like that's how equities were getting priced for a minute. So if you got in there, you know, mazel tov to you. But if you're in now, you know, you, you've sort of had the run up from then. And I think people are assuming, ah, so things didn't go badly when everybody thought there was going to be a crisis. Now I think is the precarious time. So I think on the short term, uh, yeah, maybe German equities are a little bit extended. But you, the reason you've had that rally is because the extent of the pessimism last year about Germany was really, really oversold. Long term, if you're thinking, you know, 2025, 2026, uh, German companies are some of the most sophisticated in the world. And the German government has proven time and time again that it has policy levers that it can use to support German companies. So I would be looking for the companies that are going to have an edge in a multipolar world. And I would be looking for the buying points and the buying opportunities for those companies. It's For most of them, it's not there right now. Like I said, the time was September, October. I guarantee you there will be another turn in the cycle and people will be talking about the, the demise of Germany and the end of Europe again. Those would be geopolitical signals that now is the time to start buying. Brilliant. And then just um, you know, one of the things that uh, I think you talked about, which is with geopolitics, well, I, I suppose the gold on that gold, the, the pot of gold, at the, well, no, hopefully not at the end of the rainbow, is, is where you can use geopolitics as an early warning system. Are there any things that you're seeing or looking at at the moment which may not be mainstream yet and may never become mainstream, but are things which you kind of got an eye on thinking, this is interesting, it may become relevant because, you know, really it's best when we get them before the Financial Times does. Uh, if you put me on a desert island and said, Jacob, you have one statistic that you can know every single day to understand what's going on in the, in the rest of the world, give me food prices. Um, food prices is the number one leading indicator for geopolitical unrest, economic turmoil, all these other sorts of things. I had a very, very strong view even before COVID in sort of January, February 2020 that we were going to see a major price, uh, a major spike in food prices. And I was worried about 
emerging market economies around the world. And you got hints of it. You got some problems in Pakistan. You got some problems in Peru. But you, you never really got the sort of global Arab Spring phenomenon that I was really worried about. Um, but that's still the number one leading indicator that I would point you to. Um, I, you don't have to sort of do the doom and gloom, you know, a billion people are going to die in a global famine narrative, which is out there from some geopolitical thinkers, um, to point out that, hey, East Africa, and especially the Horn of Africa, they're close to, if not already, at a famine. And you just had Ethiopia have a civil war. Sudan is launching into a civil war as well. That could create millions of migrants and refugees. You're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in the year 2023, you know, being afflicted by famine or starving, all these other things. And is that going to drive up food prices in other parts of the world? Um, so for me, food prices is one place that I would really, really focus on, no matter what year it is. But right now, there's some very interesting things happening there. And I don't think people um, are paying close enough attention. Um, beyond that, I, I think most people sort of have their fingers on the pulse right now. I mean, Turkey's elections are coming up. That's the most important election in the world in 2023. I'd be looking very, very closely there. And I'd also say that we're all sort of in suspended animation until we know what's going to happen with this Ukrainian counteroffensive in Russia. Um, we can focus on, you know, different things around the world and different indicators that I would look at. But if, if Ukraine is going to counterattack, which it looks like it is, how Ukraine does is really going to affect a lot of things in this multipolar world. So in some sense, you know, keep your eyes on all of these indicators around the world. There are issues to focus on. But until we get some resolution when it comes to Russia, Ukraine, which is, you know, one of the first things we wrote about this year, I was talking about uncertainty in China, uncertainty in Russia and Ukraine. Well, if we resolve the uncertainty in China. We haven't even gotten close to resolving the uncertainty in Russia and Ukraine yet. And that's why which maybe this is not something that people are looking at, but look at the signs of what Ukraine is doing on the ground. Look at what's happening in Crimea. Try and figure out if Putin is getting challenged internally um, or whether he's got the situation under control. Th those are things that I really think are going to move markets right now. And when you say, just to, just dig into that very slightly here at the end, which is um, how, how do people actually hedge that? Because you know, when you think about all the things that happened with Ukraine, most people ended up getting... Um, long at the wrong time in the oil and natural gas price, um, you know, nearly when it was at the margin calls and everyone getting uh, snap, taken out of stuff. What's the, what's the way to hedge it? Because nearly all, always the big moves are happening into the final move in that direction. What we want to hear is, okay, is it a case that we just have to buy volatility? Is it, is it stuff that you look at and say, okay, if, the, if Putin is put under pressure because of a Ukraine offensive and uncertainty increases in the equity world, everyone goes by the VIX, though that's not a particularly good trade. What is the sort of thing that you might think of as a potential hedge where people could go, OK, I need gold maybe? Or you know, what, what sort of thing would you look at? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways to skin that cat, as we say on the farm. The first is, what are the countries that will benefit from Russia. So let's use the scenario where Ukraine counterattacks and it gets Russia on its heels. There's also a scenario in which Ukraine counterattacks and fails and Russia's ascendant. That's a different scenario. But let's just deal with, let's say Ukraine does well with the counteroffensive. Um, well, first of all, I'd want to see what countries benefit from that. So Turkey is an obvious one. Um, Central Asian countries, maybe China is another obvious one. The European Union, too, is an obvious one. So if you think Ukraine is going to do well, um, those are some of the big players. Or if you want to get real, if, you, if you're brave, you know, go at, look at Poland. No country stands to benefit more from a Ukrainian victory in Russia than Poland, because Poland has millions of those Ukrainian refugees in their country. Um, they're going to be the ones that are going to be in front, front of the line to rebuild Ukraine. You know, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which had large swaths of Ukraine in it, was one of the largest countries in the world in the 1600s. So like that's an area where you can look. This is also a place where you can start to think about commodities. Um, we don't have a trade on right now with wheat, but wheat is one of the things I'm looking at most closely because you've started to, you know, wheat, um, it's really down from its highs in sort of the last year or two, but you're starting to get little signs that maybe things aren't going so well. So, you know, United States farmers are talking about a really bad season for winter wheat. You've got this emergence now of um, wildfires in Siberia, which the last time that happened, that affected the wheat harvest in Russia. You've got Turkish elections. What if the Turkish opposition candidate wins? He has said he's going to reverse all of Erdogan's foreign policies. What if Russia feels like the Black Sea Grain Initiative, they don't have a neutral arbiter anymore, and they start to restrict 
um, grain exports either because of that or because the war is going really badly. So they try to use their agricultural exports, which everybody's still dependent on. You know, oil and natural gas, that lever wasn't as strong for Russia, but agricultural exports absolutely have been, and wheat is one of those. You know, maybe you could see sort of changes in the price there. So that's two ways to think about it. But again, that's just one scenario. There's no clear scenario here. So when you're really, you know, the 3D chess of geopolitics is imagine let's do three or four different scenarios about what's possible, and then let's put down the trade on ideas underneath them if that is the world that is emerging. I would tell you right now there is nothing that is that sure from a scenario perspective where I would be super comfortable or have a high degree of confidence. I'm very, very close to saying wheat is interesting and Turkey is interesting, but I'm not even there yet. We don't even have the trade on the book. So those are some of the places that I would be looking. But I think that the challenge with Russia-Ukraine right now is what is possible and really challenge yourself to put down all of the possible possible scenarios out there. And then for each one of those, imagine, okay, what would be the trade if Ukraine wins? What would be the trade if Russia wins? What would the trade be if there was a stalemate? And then wait until you get some clarity about which direction we're going in and pull the trigger because you've already thought about the things that are actually going to go with that particular scenario. Brilliant. Well, I mean, Always a good rundown. And I guess the great thing is, is that um, you know, you're writing like in now, you're writing you know, two or three, maybe even four topics at a pop. So if all or some of these things start to, uh, start to materialize, then you'll be covering um, potentially all of them um, as, as they occur, which is, which is great, because I like to know what's going on as well. Uh, Jacob, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for, for filling us in and having the chat. And, uh, and I look forward to writing our next like in together in the next uh, few weeks. I mean, it's, it's great for you. There's no rest for the weary over here. But cheers, Roger. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.